Welcome. My name is Tamsin Rose and I have the great pleasure to be your moderator this afternoon. And today we're talking about the specialist nurse in European healthcare towards 2030. Just a little bit of background about this afternoon's event. We have about 180 people who've registered from Europe and beyond. And we want this to be as interactive as possible. So please start by saying hello to us in the chat. Say hello, this is, put your name and for which country you are, and that gives us a sense of who's engaged. If you have any questions or any messages that you'd like to pass to the ESNO team, please leave them in the, in the chat, which will be saved after this event, and we'll use this to engage with you and to follow up. We know that some of you already during registration had an opportunity to ask questions. We've had several questions about how you can become a member of ESNO, how you can participate in the campaign, we will get back to you. We'll be sharing information with you after this event. We're recording this webinar and a short summary of a video will be made available afterwards. And there are a couple of speakers who've got PowerPoints that you'll also be able to have access to because there's a lot of great content and information in there. After the event, for those of you who would like to have an attendance certificate, please let us know in the uh, evaluation form that we were sent and we'll make sure you can have a certificate about your participation today. The social media tag that we're hoping that we'll be, you'll be using today and in the future is ESNO2022, and we'll put it in the chat so you have a chance to see it. We're delighted that so many of you have chosen to join us today, and a warm thank you to our sponsors, and you saw their logos on our opening screen, because they made it possible for holding an event that is free for you to participate and to have participation as wide as possible. So that's all the housekeeping I have, and now it gives me great pleasure to introduce Adriano Friganovic, who is the president of ESNO, for our opening message. Adriano, the floor is yours. Can you hear me now, Tamsin? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you, Tamsin. It's always a pleasure to work with you. <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues and friends, on behalf of the European Specialist Nursing Organization, it's more than a great pleasure to be here with you on the ESNO Congress. It's not only mine or your Congress, let it also be our Congress. Last year, around this time, we decided not to have a Congress as usual, as it would take so much time. And we also know that a lot of you are still in a state of recovery after two years of hard work. We decided to aim on a full-size Congress in summer 2023, and this will take place on location in Brussels. But last summer, we also realized that we very much needed an online event in also having you involved in our process. About the new health challenges, the newer role specialist nurses face and hear you insight on our campaign. For this reason, we have set up the, this Interbellum Congress, a reflection event between two main events. Over the past sequence of three years, we had three Congresses one on location and two online with impressive input, so much motivation from all nursing health domains and specialists. One aspect was clear to us, although we are the backbone of the health system, we are far too less visible and evolved. We work 24 seven, but for some reason, we are far too less included in national and European policies and programs. There is no one else to look inside ourselves because you can't blame another for something we are responsible for. Over the past 10 years, we however gained a good position and visibility in the European health environment. We took part in the European projects in the European Commission, work with the European Medical Agency, ECDC. We are frequent in the parliament. We have more committee working in the European context and we are very proud to have our office in Brussels. Let me say the good fundamentals in stepping up and time to follow our organic flow and become more mature. Yesterday, we got confirmed accepted manuscript in journal healthcare with an impact factor 2.6, temper the specialist nursing heterogeneity in the interest of quality practice and mobility, 18 EU country study. And we are sure that this article will set a baseline for future research in the field of specialist nursing in the Europe. And I want to take Nico de Kock for, for leading this and he will probably present this later on. For future maturity, it implies also gaining a clearer vision and mission about the future. 
In this process, we have accepted that it will take another 10 years for this. We have set out, out a campaign with a program. You will learn about it in the next few hours. Today, we expect it to be a happy day for all of us. But unfortunately, aggression to Ukraine changed that. We strongly stand with our Ukraine colleagues, nurses and doctors, and we give them our full support. And for this event, we will hear from Maya Matthews from European Commission about the European context in a health and health workforce, and from Corinne, the new international nursing environment and the challenges. In this event, I invite you to listen, learn and participate in shaping the new specialist nursing role and responsibilities towards 2030. At the end, I want to thank to Bear Omen, our executive director for the hard work and enthusiasm, even he's retired. It would be harder without you, Bear. I wish you inspiring afternoon. Thank you all and welcome to our Congress. Thank you very much, uh, Adriano. And as you say, our thoughts are with colleagues uh, in Ukraine right now experiencing terrible bombardment. So thank you for giving us that moment to reflect that it's been two tough years of a pandemic for everyone, but things are extremely difficult at the moment in Ukraine. Let me now introduce Maya Matthews from the European Commission. And we've given you a really tough task. We've given you just 10 minutes and we want you to give us some perspective over the next 10 years. You know, where is the direction of healthcare going? What's the role, particularly for specialist nurses, and what's the uh, approach to health workforce planning? So it's a tough job, Maya, but I'm sure you're up to it. Go ahead. Thank you very much, Tamsin. Um, thank you to everyone. Thank you to um, uh, Dr. Adriano for, for those kind words. And I would also just like to say on behalf of the commission that our, our support and thoughts are with the people of Ukraine right now at this very difficult time. Um, I was very inspired by President Adriano's words in the um, introduction to, the, to this conference, because I think it's, it's really important to recognize that we are going through a health systems transformation already. Um, I think that the, the pandemic definitely accelerated it. Um, the pandemic put health in the spotlight for the first time, really, across the world. Everyone was talking about health. And who was in our TV screens? It was the doctors and the nurses and all of the key workers who had to continue working while many of us were being told to stay at home. I mean, COVID has really revealed existing um, weaknesses in our health system. And it also changed the way health systems were delivered. So in my unit in the European Commission, we look at health systems and we work very closely with the OECD and the Observatory on Health Systems and Policies to try to find um, new uh, ways of, uh, new innovative ways of delivering health systems. And we also look at data to try to identify kind of trends that are going on. And we recently published um, 29 country health profiles, which actually looked at how countries uh, managed the last two years of the pandemic. And from these 29 country health profiles, we produced a, a kind of companion report, it's called, which tried to um, just be quite succinct and, and, and analyze some of the key trends that came out of this work. So I would like to share with you first um, three key takeaway messages that we've identified as important elements in terms of how this new health system transformation is going to take place. The first one is that we need to understand understand better the effects of COVID on health and health systems. We are still in the middle of the pandemic. We still don't really understand the long-term effects of COVID. There are all sorts of side effects that are coming out. Um, it's called, uh, the, the WHO has called it the post-COVID syndrome. We need to understand better how this will, what, what difference this will make to health systems themselves. We have also have to understand better how we can um, address the backlog that's happened in these two years where people did not go for cancer screening, let's say, or people who had chronic diseases uh, delayed their care. And now in many countries, there's a huge backlog. So how can we also address that? Are there new ways that we can be able to, to reduce this backlog? And thirdly, of course, as people are seeing, the pandemic has also created a mental health crisis. And this is also very important. And as I said, we are still going through this. How are we actually delivering the mental health support that is needed? And we actually published a, a report recently 
by an expert panel that we had where we asked them to really focus on addressing the mental health needs of the health workforce because from what we understand all of you as you said Adriana you were at the front line but you've also had huge um, anxieties and, and mental health uh, needs and sometimes you put other needs in, in instead of your own needs so we've also looked at some very good examples in Spain for example Spain very quickly during the pandemic set up specific mental health support for the health workers. So this is about understanding, we need to better understand what is going on with COVID and how this is going to impact the health systems for years to come. The second key takeaway is something I'm sure you all experienced yourself, and that is the rapid acceleration of digital um, health. Um, partly this was already starting in many countries, but the pandemic accelerated it because there was no other choice. We had to do teleconsultations, we had to resort to, to digital tools, and countries very quickly put in place um, legislation so that this could happen. So we're now in a situation where some countries are still relying on, on digital health um, uh, tools and other countries have gone back uh, and so we're in this again this is this flux period and I think it's very important that we actually um, evaluate what's happening and we try and harness all the good um, practices that have happened but at the same time we need to be very aware that we do not want to create a two-tier system we need to make sure that those people who might be more vulnerable or do not have access to digital digital tools are not going to miss out on the health services so in that sense it's a very exciting period and I always say as well it's not just about the digitalization of health systems uh, it's also the digitalization of public health. With the COVID certificate, with the apps, uh, the track and tracing apps, we saw public health also being revolutionized. And I think this is a very important thing to also bear in mind. And then, of course, the third takeaway is about the workforce. We already knew that there were huge shortages um, across Europe. In fact, these country profiles that I mentioned to you, 15 out of these 29 country health profiles identified um, health worker shortages as being one of the key challenges to health systems. So we know that there's a problem. We need, to, we need to address this. It's a very difficult issue. Um, we know that within uh, the European Union, there are huge disparities and also within countries, the so-called medical deserts, where you have some countries that within the same country, you have huge uh, disparities in um, doctors and nurses and therefore health systems uh, delivery. And we also know that profession, the profession, and this is where I'm very interested to learn from you, that the professions are also changing. And one thing we've noticed from the from the pandemic is how task shifting was was done, that also there was training, very quick training, because we realized that the workforce was not agile, we did not have the surge capacity that we needed sometimes where, where um, nurses who had not had training in, in uh, intensive care units were, were needed intensive care units. So the European Commission Commission actually um, funded uh, a training um, which was done virtually but across Europe where, um, where we were able to, it was the European um, Society for Intensive Care Medicine, were able to train over 16,000 um, uh, health professionals to be able to have uh, the training to then be able to work in intensive care units. And this is something that we can think about further. And I will, I will go on to that as, as I finalize. But for me also, the workforce is also bringing now into light what skills are needed. So when you look at 2030, what are the new skills that are needed for the health workforce? The idea of this digitalization, what does this do to the relationship between the patient and the healthcare provider? Um, you know, th there's a lot of change going on here. And do we have the skills and the training needed to do that. So these are some of the key um, ideas. These are the key takeaways that, that we have identified. And it would be very interesting to hear from you if these are also issues that you that resonate with you. Um, 
from the European Union's point of view, we responded with the European Health Union, which was really an attempt to, to, um, to address the, the concerns of the citizens, because when the pandemic first um, happened, there was a bit of a shock that the European Union did not have the powers or the, or the, the skills or the projects or the money available to help member states. As you know, health is, is a national competence, but we managed to, to create uh, these policies and uh, these are the policies where we have a new package on being able to respond quicker. We have a new, um, a, uh, of, um, we've created a new directorate in the European Commission, the um, Health Emergency and Response Authority. We also have a uh, policy on pharmaceuticals where we're looking at really addressing the unmet needs and uh, trying to, to, to galvanize more innovation in areas where there isn't already pharmaceuticals. We have a cancer plan as well, which is the first time that we've put all of the different steps of the clinical pathway on cancer to try to attempt to bring this all together to really have change. So these are kind of some of the policy areas. And in the digital area, we are uh, looking for a proposal on the European health data space, which will kind of create an infrastructure within Europe where we will, we will be able to share information and data more. So I know I'm running out of time. Um, I wanted to just mention two quick um, funding uh, streams, because I think it's interesting also for, for the people to know um, that uh, we have something called the Recovery and Resilience Facility, which was basically Europe's way of being able to build back from the pandemic. The focus of this huge um, 372 billion euro package is focused on the, the digital and green transition. But health, of course, is a main element in this. And each country um, submits a plan, a resilience and recovery plan. And so far, 22 plans have been adopted. And I'm happy to say that in all of those 22 plans, um, there's a health component in them. And in the total, there's 37 billion euros going into the health systems from this fund. Um, we also have the European Health um, Programme, a Europe for Health Programme with a 5.3 billion um, um, envelope. And here I just want to also announce that uh, in terms of uh, health workforce, we have just launched a call for proposals for training, for continuous professional training, because we feel again, as I said, that you know best what your constituents need in terms of training. When we did some stakeholder outreach, including to, to Esno, to, to Bear and Adriano, um, it was very clear that you know best what your constituents needs in terms of training. And so we've opened up this, um, this call for proposals and we hope very much that you will apply and be able to then uh, carry out the training um, across Europe for, for your constituents. So in conclusion, I just want to say that I think that we are already in the midst of a health uh, system transformation. Um, there's some very exciting elements, but I would I, I do think that there are two very important things to keep in mind. One is that we need to continue partnership and collaboration, new forms of partnership, new forms of collaboration, involving the patients as well, much more in their care. And the second thing is, I think we cannot lose sight of the sustainable development goals and the importance of universal health coverage and leaving no one behind. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Maya. You set up our, the, our following discussions very nicely, lots of information, and we'll make sure that everyone who's, who's on this can have access to the links about the EU for Health and the Resilience Programme and Package. So that brings to an end this first block of introduction. And now I'll pass over to Bert for the next section. Thank you so much, uh, Tamsin. And um, yeah, this is a, uh, a, a very great uh, opening of, of today's uh, conference. Um, I'm Bert uh, Vrijhoef, uh, I'm based in the Netherlands, um, and um, uh, I have a background in health services and systems researcher, and um, I'm confident to call myself a um, friend of, of ESNO. Um, so it is uh, my pleasure uh, to introduce to you uh, Dr. Corina uh, Schikluna. Um, she is a um, senior lecturer and coordinator of the skin and wound care course at the Faculty of Health Sciences uh, Department of Nursing at the uh, Master Day Hospital in Malta. And Corinne is gonna 
uh, talk about, um, as you can see now, leadership and specialist nurses. So, Corinne, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Bert, for the um, introduction. I am a lecturer at the University of Malta, that's uh, correct. And um, I'm, I've been asked, and I wish to thank ESNO for inviting me to speak about two of the, I, in my opinion, very important and pertinent topics um, in nursing at the moment. One is about leadership and the other one is about specialist nurses. And I wish to thank Maya for a very um, inspiring and thoughtful talk and important for us to know what the European Commission is talking about. And I think I'm going a bit further. All those things that were mentioned by Maya is, are very important. But I believe we need to go back to the core of what is still happening or what needs to be happening in nursing and specialist nursing and leadership. As I said, I'm Corinne. I have no conflict of interest in this presentation and I'm a lecturer at the moment. I was a, a specialist nurse for a few years uh, before I went into management and now into education. I'll be talking to you a bit about specialist nurses and leadership and future recommendations. I think it's important to go back, as I said, to the backbones of where we are in specialist nurses. And it, it is becoming clearer now. Um, uh, ICN has issued, you know, in 2020, a position paper on uh, advanced practice nurses. And although we are still under the umbrella of advanced practice, and that hasn't changed since 2008, I think what is important is um, the importance of specialist nurses being um, looked at more from an educational part. So if we look, it's not only about the skills and experience um, and beyond, obviously, the generalist knowledge. But now ICN has taken a stand and said that it is about having a master's level and all the other things that are incorporated in the position statements that they issued in 2020. What is different, surely, is um, we are looking at um, you know, the vision of ICN into what they're saying is there's the generalist nurse and the specialized nurse and then the clinical nurse specialist. When I looked into this a bit, Although it might be confusing, but there is more explanation and you will have the references at the end of this presentation, um, is practically what they're saying is you can have a generalist nurse that goes into a specialist area, gains the um, competence um, and the standards required in that area, but you will only be considered a clinical nurse specialist until um, or when she gets a master's degree. So this has been at least ironed out. And I think, you know, this is where I was saying that we have core things to really um, iron out in the next 10 years. I believe, you know, it's not gonna happen overnight and we need to really work together to get these definitions out and a clearer understanding of um, our roles, really. We need to also celebrate what we already know about specialist nurses. We know that having specialist nurses will reduce unnecessary hospital admissions and readmissions. We know um, specialist nurses have an effect on reducing waiting times and freeing up times. As Maya was saying in her introduction, in our introduction, you know, how can we look at the backlog, utilize specialist nurses in the best possible way? We know we have the capabilities. We know we were trained for it. So if we are um, uh, needed, we can rise up to the occasion and improve access to care. We know we've done it and uh, we know we, we can do it again. We have to be given the opportunity. Um, and obviously we also know that uh, we can educate um, health and social care professionals and obviously support patients in the community as we have seen throughout the, the pandemic. You know, specialist nurses were on the phones, were using technologies, to keep patients calm, to keep them um, continuing with their medication, especially in chronic illness. So we have seen this. I think it's also important to look at um, uh, specialist nurses having pillars. We've known this. Now we need to really 
work on the gaps that are out there. We know we need the education and we know about the knowledge and the professional experience and competence. Um, however, one thing that keeps on cropping up is the issue of leadership. It's, it's leadership and linking it with the development of service. Even in my study, when I did the study in Malta on my PhD, the issue of leadership did come up. And it didn't only come up within the focus groups of um, specialist nurses, but it came up with the stakeholders, even colleagues, a multidisciplinary team and consultants. The fact that leadership is very important in our roles um, was so even in such a small study as mine in Malta this was also very clear again leadership um, is something that is not so uh, simple and it also goes in with the situation of nursing in a country and the medical reality what do I really mean about this it's not easy um, even in Europe, let alone, let alone globally. But let's look at Europe. Each country has a different reality, a different reality to the medical situation, um, the medical shortage, the nursing shortage, um, how women are viewed. We know that there's a direct link, and this is not only me saying it now, WHO is actually explicitly saying that um, when women are not sort of regarded in a society, the nursing is going to lag behind because we know that nursing is mainly predominantly female. So that is an issue we all need to tackle. Leadership again, we might be forward thinking about women in society, but where are they? Are they in parliament? Are they taking decisions? Are they in leading positions to have a voice? And again, the medical reality where um, when we see a lot of things about policy, we usually see our medical colleagues and not nursing involved in policy. And this could be related again to culture. It could be related again to the situation of nursing or leaders amongst nurses. So these are all things that I would like to think that we need to improve on in the next 10 years. Another big issue is about um, regulation. We know how important regulation is. It's not only um, uh, about having role clarity and recognition, but it's also about patient safety and acceptance by um, consumers and other health healthcare professionals. We know um, we need to have regulation, we need to have standards, uh, we need to have this, so we will become more visible in demonstrating our roles and being accepted. And we also know how important it is when we do have these things ironed out and in countries that they do have them, they have better nurse retention and experienced nurse retention because nurses can be utilized or they feel more satisfied in their roles. We know that nursing is not all about money. And when we have nurses that are respected in their workplace, um, they usually stick to it and they will make a difference. It's also about education and um, not only regulation. We've seen that, um, as I mentioned, the status of women, but it's also about strengthening nurse leadership. In Malta, even we are taking this very seriously, even with our nursing students, we're starting from day one to talk about leadership, about global health, about the importance they have in society, in the organization, nationally, internationally. We are starting from day one, and this has to be right across Europe for us to make um, leaders in the making, so to say. Unfortunately, the WHO report in 2020 um, uh, was not that, uh, you know, well identified areas that we need to work on. And this is mainly about enabling um, nurses to work in their full potential, not to only be subordinate and in the direction of doctors. Um, we need to be more visible uh, and we need to have the opportunities to be at policy level. And we need more training and professional development. WHO also came up with more uh, about policy priority, adapting workplaces that we, we will enable nurses and midwives to take um, a stand and to have a voice um, in the delivery of care. 
we need to optimize the workplace and the modes of uh, models of delivery. We need to even look at the scope of practice and the responsibilities that nurses have and see again what Maya was saying, how can we look at the backlog? How can we look at public health, utilize the nurses to their full potential, I say, look at how we can develop the scope of practice of nurses and then obviously ensuring decent working conditions for these nurses. I said, we don't always look at money, but it always helps when we, the money and the, the, the work environment enables a good working environment to stay into a position. I think finally, we need to look at the wider implications. We need to look at addressing gender related barriers and, and leadership, because we know that this will improve the health situations for all. We need to really look about um, letting nurses um, being utilized in the best possible ways and looking at how advanced practice roles can enhance um, global healthcare. We know it, but we just have to be more involved and have policies implemented to enable us to get there. I thank you very much for your attention. And these are the references um, of this presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Corinne, for this uh, very inspiring um, a keynote. Um, and um, given that we still have some time for uh, questions, uh, I, will, I will open up the floor for people to post their questions. Uh, but let me start uh, asking you a uh, first question. Um, being a, a leader yourself, uh, I think you are one of the uh, prominent uh, um, specialist nurses in, in Malta, uh, as well as in Europe. Uh, I've seen you um, during numerous occasions um, at ESNO conferences. Um, what would you recommend um, individual nurses, um, as well as ESNO, um, to do in order to improve uh, the leadership situation, uh, let's say within the next 12 months? Okay. Well, there are, it's multifaceted, but I start from myself. As an educator now, the first thing I did was look at how I can improve the situation. And I am, you know, discussing, we're working, we're trying to implement the topics of leadership, about global health, about the importance of nurses having a voice. And, you know, we talk about nurses being on the menu and not on the table. This is where we're starting. We're starting even students, encouraging them to be involved in um, health committees, even in political committees. They need to be out there. They need to start learning how to be part of the leadership um, scheme, if you want to know, if, if I can say that. So we need to get nurses more political in a way and trained even on policy. Um, I also, you know, wearing a different hat in the association and, you know, on a specialist role in wound care, because that's where I'm coming from. Um, we are discussing even in our committees about how to enable nurses um, becoming more, um, you know, becoming more uh, of leaders and making a difference, even in developments of policies and services. And that is no easy task because it, there is the cultural element, there's the political element. So uh, we're working towards it. Um, I think also internationally, I would always suggest that nurses hook up with international organizations like ESNO, even on a, an associate um, basis like I am, because we still don't have a, a skin and wound care sort of organization for nurses at a European level. We have Yuma doing wounds and we have the EADV doing dermatology, but we don't have something that is purely nursing. So this is something that it doesn't, it didn't put me back. I, I, I joined as no as an associate. I have a voice and everybody could have a voice and we all need individuals to, um, to take part and, uh, you know, develop themselves and even their country. They're, they're parts of the world sort of thing. I even will suggest 
questioning what is happening at, uh, at policy level and at regulation level. We cannot not take this seriously if we want to be taken seriously, both by the patients and by our colleagues. And obviously, when we join ESNO, you know, we're looking at a big campaign for the next 10 years. That is really exciting. So get on board. Everything helps and you will have a say for sure. Uh, <clears throat> all right, thanks. Um, th th there's one question um, being raised here uh, uh, in the public, and um, that is, uh, what are the objectives of WHO during the coronavirus pandemic, I suppose, related to what you just said, leadership nurses? Well, I am no spokesman for WHO, <laughs> and I will not even dare go down that line. Um, my role was obviously looking at the work that was done by WHO, and it's good work about the nursing report, um, uh, the, the state of affairs for nursing in 2020. And it gave us a really good idea of what is happening out there. So I'm, I'm sorry I won't be able to delve into the objectives of the pandemic, but I'm sure, as um, you know, we heard from the commission by Maya, um, there is a lot of learning going on. And I hope that we continue evaluating uh, the importance of, you know, as we saw, uh, migration, about utilizing expertise, about being prepared. Um, there are so many things that we, you know, WHO is talking about them. But I'm not going to talk on their behalf, but we know that um, for sure there are lots of objectives out there that we can learn from. Thank you so much, Corinne. Thank you so much. Um, OK, um, time to move on to the next block, Block C, uh, ESNO's campaign and program. So I'm going to hand over to Tamsin. Tamsin, over to you. Thank you very much. And it was a really good start to the session because at the beginning, I think Maya set out how EU countries have recognised the critical challenge of ensuring they've got a sustainable, well-supported, well-trained health workforce. And Karina has just highlighted for us, you know, the evolving role of nurses advancing their careers and their, and their professional landscape, both in the clinical setting and in the political setting, and talked about the role of leadership. And I think that brings us very nicely to what we're going to talk about now. And I'm delighted to pass the floor to Bear, who's the uh, Executive Director of, of ESNO, who's going to introduce to us the campaign. Bear. Thank you very much, Tamsin. Tam um... Yeah, there is so much to say, just um, in, it's, it's, it's a conference with a lot of uh, speaking slots and it's, um, it's very important just to, to stick to my time. I have two, um, um, two, uh, two presentations, one short video and the video is more as a kind of an introduction. Why is this campaign, what are we doing? And also reflecting on the Korean's words that we have to be more out of our scope, a bit more wider than, uh, than only our clinical work in the ward. That's not nursing. Nursing is so much bigger. So in this uh, short video, I'd like to uh, ask the, uh, the, um, the team just to, uh, to, 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 give it, uh, to give it a start. And after that, I'll do a nice uh, PowerPoint presentation. Thank you.
Well, so much thank you. <clears throat> it's a kind of a short introduction that shows that nursing world is far much more and that we really need to stepping into open doors. Let me screen, let me share my, uh, my screen. There, and while we're doing that, is that wonderful video that we've got lots of congratulations already coming in the chat. That will be on the ESNO website, so people will be able to share that video more yeah, widely. We have our, yeah, absolutely. We have our uh, ESNO YouTube channel. So um, we will uh, we will include it on the uh, on the YouTube channel, and we will um, share it also to uh, uh, to uh, to to everybody. I think kind of an inspiration, eh? um, because inspiration yes. is also driven me. Well, Adriano, thank me uh, for all the work, but it hasn't has not been possible without the the moral support of so many others. So uh, I'm just going to give a kind of an introduction to the program. The program good understanding is going to be launched 12 may international nursing day 20 uh, in this year so this is a kind of an introduction and um we would very much like to have some input from the members during on the participants on the of of the of, of, of this congress just to fine-tune it because it's the start um so uh, first of all, no, well, this is a kind of a conflict of interest disclaimer, no conflicts uh, related to this presentation. And let me first start uh, my presentation in uh, that I'm going to speak about six aspects. First of all, let's not forget why we are online. Why we are online. Uh, we need to address the new health paradigmas. Uh, I give you a kind of an introduction on the program because the program is broke, uh, broke up in, uh, in, se in, in sections and we hope that for every nurse that they feel say, well, yes, I, for this part, I feel connected. Then I need to talk about the short, uh, some wordings about campaigning because nurses don't like campaigning. They like to do their work, but campaigning is really essential. And then talking about unheard stories. Stories are so much important. I'll come back to this uh, later. And well, we have the time. It's 10 years, a decade, but still it's not endlessly. So let's not forget, why are we here online? And well, the last year, no, but two years ago, uh, the COVID came in and everyone, there was a lot of despair. What's happening? Uh, colleagues uh, just holding each other. There was a, really a group, a, a sense of belonging. Let's do this together. Uh, we have uh, intensive care nurses um, at the end of the day, just going to the, to the um, just bringing people uh, to, the, to the mortuary. It's really terrible what, what, uh, what, what happens. We saw a lot of uh, clumsy um, aspects of issues now on the, on, the, on the PPE. We were not prepared, as you see on this image, people with two mouth caps, with tapes. So it's, let's not forget, it was, for a lot of us, it was still yesterday. It's still on our face, what's, what's, what, 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 what's happening. Here you can see the image of an intensive care nurse, of an intensive care unit, and please be aware, they're not only intensive care nurses, they're also the, 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 the doctors working there, also some managers uh, step, uh, step in. So uh, they're all equal in this. And most important of, of this, uh, let's not forget the care, the, 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 the home care settings, uh, where people had to die alone without a family and only with nurses, uh, you see also with uh, with Im improvised the protection just uh, with with an image on their um, on their on their mobile just to, to, to say their relatives goodbye it was really impressive so let's not forget that ever and also well we also know uh, nurse Elena uh, Elena Pagliarini you don't don't know the name uh, she came as a symbol but if you're looking at this image everyone knows. Uh, she fell asleep, and after that, she 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 got uh, she got covered, recovered, and she's uh, and she's back on track and, 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 and uh, on the, on the ward. So this is also a bit of the background, and also when we looked at uh, hear that the words of, uh, of 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 Maya, she said, "Well, she, there's a lot of." She also mentioned there's a crossroads uh, on uh, on on health, but there's also a role for us uh, to um, to take. Eh? So there's um, um, it's. 
it's it is good to have this in mind. So you can look at a roadmap. So they're bringing people together for shared actions, and um, and that they are good for shaping the digital evolution. You also can looking at forecasts based on extrapolation of work and uh, what went well and how do we go forward, but also new pathways. But there is also a lot of a lot of scenarios. So there's there's so much aspects if you were talking about health in the future. And, and there's a role for each of us, each of us, no one, no one excluded. And for a lot of nurses, and that's also what uh, Corinne also uh, added, uh, if you look at the first health acute response, well, there was this very medical dominated, and we're very blessed with this, with this, uh, what, what we achieved. Also with the pharma that they developed these vaccines that we, that we have nurses able to train, and there's, uh, but it was very medical. And what we see at the moment, that somehow we forgot the whole conceptual thinking. They have also a society. Uh, we have also um, uh, the chronic. We have, we have the elderly, the NCDs, the, 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 uh, the non-communicable -com diseases, extended care. So uh, at the end, we really need to, uh, to be more in, uh, in integrated. And that's not only in care, but also in the in the in the advocacy. So if you can look at the system, you can have degenerated system approach where you are, are taking the attitude of the user, using the sources, but that comes to an end, and that we uh, we experience a lot of this. But also you can have also the regenerated system. You're going up to how how to uh, how to energize it. So you have to go from the user's approach, which is less effective to a more investment approach which is more effective and we all need each other on this so what this really needs a kind of a new mindset so to be regenerative sorry for the words you have to be restorative sustainable also green and extra active so there's there is there's more than only making new shortcuts. So we have to think more uh, conceptual. So if I go to the program, uh, <laughs> I'm the privilege. I'm just having the first one, and um, well, the designer worked on this only this afternoon. And mind you, it was a late. It was a, a person from uh, living in Kiev. At the moment, so uh, there was there was a hard a hard work done, and the program it's uh, not just a program, it's um, it's a constructive response for where it did go wrong and how uh, how to work to a better safety healthcare. So it's not only for us as nurses, but for good quality of patient care. So this is a kind of a start, and this is the front page. And after the event, this, uh, you, you're going to be invited to have a good look and also give your, give your reflections. The goals of this program are showcasing uh, the best we have, also our, uh, our diversity, uh, contribute to ex as expertise, just taking part of act as an expert, but also um, doing a lot of promotion. And at the end, we hope it will also contribute to uh, retention and recruit, uh, recruitment. So oh, the program has five main pillars. The uh, recognition, providing the relevant uh, expertise, a lot of uh, relations, internal and external, advocacy and research. Um, recognition uh, is, is very important. So I'll go through the slide a little bit uh, faster because after the event, you, uh, you can have a look at it uh, for, for yourself. It's really expertise. Yes, so because you cannot go there without people showing what you uh, what you can do. Relations is very important for us as ESNO is to our, our internal relation. Talk with the members, talk with the associates, and uh, and then also to the external. So you, it's not good to have only external good contacts if you're if if your house if you haven't done your housework internally. Then really going to ad 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 advocacy, taking more the political uh, environment, but also going to magazines and then uh, a, a lot of other aspects, and going to do and, and have your research to do to do your homework. Well, Adriano already uh, explained the publication what uh, what what is what is coming up, 
and also contribute to expertise. So we did our um, presentation. We did a, we, we did some activities on infection prevention. Um, we did some uh, on surgical smoke, and also uh, we have also a very interesting program. Uh, working on the new curricula on the plasma collection centers and just mark your day it's the, the 2nd of march we have uh, the introduction so you have a five pillar integrated so you have five circles if you like the <laughs> olympic games you might be you might fire, feel feel inspired campaigning is very much important is speaking out not only waiting for the one person at the top just saying what to do just be active on local level and national level and it's also uh, get used to a new mind um how mind and heart set and also going to uh, to to storytelling and uh something we know very much well that last year we had a wonderful event uh, and also on bit on the catharsis we want to hear your stories because at the end it doesn't it makes signs strange but stories really make a difference they make something much more different than than scientific papers and we want to have a special webinar in september 2022 with uh, with a with an expert on why is storytelling so important timeline we have time but not endlessly so what we did in 2021 where well, we drafted the progress today we have this introduction 12 May, we have the formal launch, and then we go to more development. So we have to do some more policy and strategy. And next year, here in Brussels, we want to have a very physical event. And then we have some uh, some beta analysis and just going from, uh, from there. So our next step and challenge is we need feedback from everyone before we're going to finalize the program. We want to connect with members. We find a program. We want to also get some campaigning uh, scheduling with milestone and priority. Sponsors will be very important and supporters and our activities. Well, this is a bit of my presentation. So in a nutshell, I'm hoping I was a bit in time. Great. Yeah. Thanks, for, thanks very much, Bear. And you've, you've indicated there's uh, the brand new program is available that just got finished this afternoon. I'm sure people will be interested in, in downloading it, looking at it. But uh, let's just start with a, a couple of questions for you. Where am I speaking to you from? Uh, where are you right now, Bear? Oh, I'm, I'm very proud to, uh, to, to explain that I'm here in Brussels. Uh, we have our new office. <laughs> ah, congratulations. Yeah, and I think somewhere in the bill, in the far away, there's maybe also the building of, <laughs> of Maya, and I'm not sure where you are. But really proud to be. So we ended our office um, two years ago because we didn't know what's going to happen in this digital world. Uh, but we are an inflexible office, and um, so that's uh, I'm really proud to be here. But also being physical here, and always. Uh, so yeah, thanks. Great. Okay, tell me a little bit more about the the context and background to this campaign. It's it's a fantastic campaign, and Bear, you're clearly very passionate about it. Tell me, you know. What was behind it? What do you want to achieve with it? Okay, well, it started actually uh, with the year of the nurse. We were all so proud, the year of the nurse. That's what we hear it already two years in advance. And then when it started, the pandemic, the, the pandemic started. And it just was a very strange thing because we really were able to prove what we could do. But everything was so overshadowed to the to, to the disease we saw um we saw nurses um working very hard on the very difficult conditions um working in new con in, in a new context we had uh, we had also um new nurses as students coming in an alternative just go to school just say click they close the school they had to go to the ward and there they had to experience situations which which is not fit for young nurses. If people are in their last phase of life, then you only want to have nurses experienced on the on, on this. So 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 much happened. So what we did, we created this uh, this theme um, with uh, with support also with the uh, what is the ZN team where we. Uh, where was also a very great inspiration to us in the caring of nurse let's 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 do the caring of nurse and then 
the year was not enough. So that's why we say, well, just let's take time for this and let's declare, declare the decade of the nurse under the caring for the nurses. So let's make it a good campaign. And uh, so, so let, let us give some time for this. So that is a bit of the uh, of, uh, of okay. the back. So you've gone from the year of the nurse, then the pandemic hit, and there was a recognition that we need we need more than this. We need a whole decade to achieve some of these big objectives. So tell us a little bit about the campaign that you're launching. Is this something that's going to be led and managed uh, from the ESNO team in Brussels, or is it something where you hope there's much more engagement at national level and individual nurses and their allies will be involved? Yeah, you know, I think the, um, you see, if you're thinking about nurse in international European context, it's very difficult if you're working there from a very, uh, from, from your, from your local issues, from your local, uh, of your national um, uh, view. So it's good to have a kind of a broad scope. And that was, uh, and that our program is more as a guiding, as a more the kind of a fundament and every nation can do can can uh, can give their cultural um, sig signature signature uh, to this. So as I explained, the um, the this uh, the, the formal launch will be the twelfth of May, but we will like to we would like to uh, every year to giving an, an update, just so if you have an annual update. So every twelfth May every in in the next in in the next years it will be it will be updated but also included with the, the achievements. So we want to, uh, we want to be, uh, we, we, uh, we want to celebrate achievements. So not only looking at the problems, but what, uh, what went, uh, what did we write? Uh, what did we write? And where do we find the new obstacles? So, um, but it's, it, it, it's going to be in a kind of an organic uh, or organic uh, campaign. So not rather than, Top down, okay. but more as a as a as a as a hybrid. Um, as a okay. hybrid. Um, yep. Thanks, and and you showed us this lovely image of the five different uh, pillars that need to be done. We saw them as the Olympic rings, and they all looked like they were equal there. But is there one that you think is the most ambitious and perhaps the most challenging? The ring that we should all be reaching to grasp. Well, for us, it's education, recognition, and harmonization of training. In the Netherlands, I'm, 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 it's, it's, very, it's, it's embedded in the Dutch law. The nurses are, are allowed to do the prescribing. But if you go to other countries, it's they have such a very low profile, and um, the everything what they do is even blocked. There's not a. It's, it, it, we need a really a new culture, culture, uh, culture change. So uh, it's that. That's why it's uh, it's really on the it's it's really on the top. So the other as we are integrated, but we really need uh, f far more done uh, on the uh, on the on the rec on on the recognition in all okay. European regions. Yeah. That well, that's certainly something very ambitious, and I would imagine that would be one of the key success criteria for your campaign. If you're looking at over over. 10 year period and it takes time to change re legislation and regulatory frameworks. It would tell me how you're going to measure the success of your campaign. What do you hope will have achieved by 2030? Well, it, 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 if you look at the campaign, there's a there's a page in that that, says a, that uh, gives a, a proposal on an index on an index. If you're making an index now, where is the education coming? Where's the experience? Where's your position? But also where's the well-being? Are is your is your are your safety at work? Uh, so uh, do you uh, do you have a good sleep and work balance? And if you live looking at safety at work, you also think saying are you as a lady uh, are they very uh, the are they well well represented? But also um, for, uh, for for example on, uh, on on education, are you well? How much are you supported in your continual professional development? How are this? So this index would be uh, would be very interesting to follow up in the in the in the in, in the in, in the decade to come. So it will be also very interesting for uh, for nations to um, to step into this index and do something about it. Okay. And just a last question, which is to ask you to give us a little bit more about the conference that you're going to hold in May. Who's it for and what you're hoping that the audience who are watching us now, what do you hope that they will be doing in connection with that conference? Well, at the end, health is interdisciplinary. We want to have, we want to have this for the nurses. 
but I also like that the nurses bring their doctors, their physicians, their the 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 the, the their, their directors, because the directors of the, the and, and the managers, um, they are also working with the nurses. So uh, at the end, it, uh, we really want to have this uh, physical event and uh, meeting everyone in personal, uh, because this personal interpersonal contact does so much more, gives us so much more than uh, than this uh, than this online, and we want to have this a very 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 uh, a very big event, and we do this in the summer, um, close uh, just at the end of the academic year, just before everyone goes on the uh, to the uh, to the to the to the beach. Um, just having a having a good time also together because that's really what nurses like. Also, uh, having a, uh, having a good time and it's also we hope that by that time there will there will nurses find enough inspiration and also recovered uh, just to um, just to be there and we want to have them invited. So thank you, Ben. Just to, to, to finalise, the message for all of you is there's an opportunity to come together at the event of the European Parliament. We want to have a thousand nurses there for the launch of the campaign. And we're hoping that to see even more people at the next physical Congress, which will be in 2023. Thank you very much, Bear. And I'm going to bring this section to a conclusion. All right. Thanks, uh, Bear. Thanks, uh, Tamsin. Um... Um, once again, um, ESNO, uh, I suppose, proves to be on top of uh, many important issues. And with such a campaign, uh, I think uh, we're all looking forward, uh, hopefully, uh, you as well, uh, to participate uh, in some way or the other. Uh, so um, halfway, uh, let's move from uh, Europe uh, via leadership uh, and the ESNO campaign for the next years to uh, what is referred to as today as health arrivals. Um, so uh, in this session, we will have uh, two um, speakers. Uh, I will introduce the first speaker um, and then uh, I will invite the first speaker to present. Uh, and uh, after um, his presentation, I will present the, the second speaker. So the first speaker then is uh, Luigi Abuzzo. Uh, Luigi is a collaborate professional um, health nurse at CPS uh, Nurse National Agency for uh, Regional Health Services and Health Workforce Planning, uh, Aginas in uh, Italy. And um, Luigi is uh, gonna talk about uh, task shifting and task shifting has very briefly uh, been introduced by uh, uh, Maya Matthews, I think, has a very important strategy uh, to deal with um, some of the important workforce uh, issues. So, Luigi, um, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Bert. Uh, hello, everyone. Okay, I'm going to share with you uh, my short presentation on task shifting. And uh, as we have seen from previous presentation, we need regulations, we have sh staff shortage, and we need more nurse lead programs. And in this uh, short presentation, I hope to, um, to touch the, um, the task shifting uh, and uh, um, how task shifting could be uh, help uh, nurses uh, uh, in uh, the specialist nurses in uh, European healthcare towards 2030. And let's start uh, uh, to explaining what is task shifting. And uh, um, the WHO definition uh, of the 2008. Um, the definition is the rational redistribution of tasks among health workforce teams. So it concerns the possibility of transferring skills from one professional to another or to a, uh, from a professional or to a caregiver or a patient or to an innovative technological instrument. In fact, we have various types of task shifting as an increasing the depth of the job by extending the role or skills of a particular group of healthcare workers or with the substitution or delegation of skills 
We exchange one type of work from one profession to another group of uh, professionists, breaking traditional professional divides. Or with task shifting, we uh, also uh, have the possibility to create uh, of new skills, of the creation of the new skills and so on. Why it is important to uh, talk, to touch the uh, task shifting project? Because uh, with task shifting, we have the possibility to face staff shortage, to increase the skills of the staff, to increase collaboration between healthcare workers, to face the costs, but we have uh, also um, the possibility uh, to include better awareness in the management of disease by patients or caregivers. Some examples that we can report during COVID-19 are, for example, the body temperature control made by electronic instrument or by non-health personnel, or even the execution of swabs by pharmacists. We have, I could uh, represent some results of past experience. Often with task shifting, we have uh, the uh, regularization of in, uh, informal practice. And uh, uh, with task shifting um, uh, has involved, uh, task shifting uh, has involved in recent years, which often see the regularization of practice already consolidated informally in various care settings that have led to some legislative changes in uh, uh, Belgium, Italy, Ireland, the Netherlands, and Scotland. And finally, I, I could report the recognition of the specialist family nurse in Italy last year. What's happening uh, uh, in Europe? In Europe, uh, we have a project called uh, TASHI. Uh, TASHI has been active since last year, which sees various European countries involved in with the aim to study and evaluate task shifting in various settings, such as task shifting between family doctors and, nurse and nurses in primary care, in mental health care, the use of telemedicine in the wound care setting, and task shifting in the field of ophthalmology. Some of the main results of TASHI will be a guidebook of task shifting, uh, various case studies, set of the recommendation for task shifting actions, collection of useful tools and practice, and the practical training materials and curriculum for task shifting. TASHI project involves seven partners, uh, partners in uh, uh, various European countries, such as Italy, the Netherlands, Estonia, Norway, Lithuania, and Hungary. Hungary uh, had the lead of the project. I could report uh, uh, some example, because uh, I also want to report what I think uh, represents strengths or weaknesses, threats or opportunities for uh, nurses. Among the strengths is the push to work in a team, courses already av available for same areas, and some activities are already performed informally by nurses. While among the threats, certainly some that we see also exposed in this slide, it may happen that there is no real recognition of the transfer of competencies. So uh, in these three examples from Italy, uh, we could see uh, the um, situation of vascular uh, access vascular specialist nurses and uh, echocardiographist echo nurses and wound care specialist nurses. So we can see that uh, uh, these specialist nurses are trained with one or two years postgraduate course. This course have uh, a cost between uh, two, uh, uh, 2,500 euros to 3,500 uh, euros. And we can see that uh, nurses now can formally implant peripher peripherally uh, central catheters, but they have more responsibility, but the same salary. Or uh, in uh, uh, the field of the echocardiography, nurses now do echocardiography, but informally, in an uh, informal way, and it, this is not recognized. Nurses can sign the report. 
or in a wound care setting often is not recognized because uh, nurses can pres prescribe dressings. How task shifting is important to nurses towards uh, 2030 and uh, for the European Specialist Nurses Organization? Uh, I think, in my opinion, uh, that is no, uh, have to follow ongoing projects in Europe and insist on the, rec on the recognition of skills already performed by nurses, but which are not formally recognized. And uh, we have uh, the possibility to propose new nurse-led projects, new specialization and training. Understand the regulation of the different European countries is important. So to understanding the consequences of task shifting uh, to understanding the barriers and facilitators of task shifting. And um, we have to push for the uh, European certification, uh, certification uh, of the different specialization and skills, and obviously made by the European Specialist Nurses Organization. And uh, I really thank you for, uh, uh, for uh, uh, to give me the possibility of this presentation in this Congress. Thank you so much, uh, Luigi. Um... Um, we will uh, move on to the next speaker. And if we still have time within this uh, session, I will get back to you, uh, Luigi, with um, perhaps one or two questions. Uh, so it's my pleasure then to introduce to you Alessandro, uh, Dr. Alessandro Stivano, uh, who is a, a professor, um, health professions, uh, bachelor and master's degree courses at the University of Rome, um, Tor Vergata in Italy. Uh, he's the research coordinator at the Center of Excellence for Nursing Scholarship, uh, OPI of Rome, and he's also a, a visiting professor at Boston College, uh, United States of America. And um, Dr. Stivano is um, going to talk about the uh, CESN program. Um, Alessandro, well, thank, yeah, thank invite you. you. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you. Birth and all colleagues uh, who are listening to us. <clears throat> and um, this afternoon, uh, uh, I think uh, I've uh, uh, shared my presentation. And, uh, you know, this afternoon uh, I'm talking about, uh, you know, this proposal for the creation of the certification for the uh, European Specialist Nerves. And, uh, you know, this program is part of the development uh, plan of the ESNO, because, you know, if, uh, if you have seen the presentation of Bear about the five pillars, uh, it, it's uh, uh, well embedded in the first pillar of uh, harmonization of uh, different uh, uh, credentials and different, uh, you know, uh, practice uh, uh, activities of nurses in Europe. And, uh, you know, this, uh, this, uh, this uh, program uh, is uh, specifically aimed to, to advance, uh, you know, specialist nurses uh, among the different uh, European countries. Uh, and uh, we know because uh, it was uh, or already underlined very well by, by their omen that there are different legislation and not all nurses can do the same things uh, in different countries. Uh, and uh, we have we have already seen uh, with the previous presentation by by Luigi Apuso, you know that uh, you know in some in some cases nurses can prescribe, in other cases, as in the case uh, of Italy or other countries, this this uh, power of prescription is need is not uh, is not uh, the case for nurses, uh, unfortunately. But things are moving, and uh, we have to have to move these things uh, among the different European countries. So we, the partners of this project uh, will be um, uh, CGFNS International, that is a multinational immigration neutral, non-profit global standard setting organization. It's a global recognized authority on the standards, education, credential evaluation of migrating nurses and healthcare professionals. And, you know, uh, I would like uh, to uh, underline that uh, in CGFNS, uh, 
has already collaborated with many organizations worldwide to develop these kind of programs. And uh, particularly, uh, CGFNS is collaborating with academic institutions, certification bodies, regulatory authorities, employer self care systems. And uh, over 45 years, uh, this organization has served more than 3 million of healthcare professional, professionals. Uh, and uh, most of them uh, are nurses. So we are partnering with this important organization to launch this project for, uh, for uh, uh, you know, with this trusted partner also for the security and data, data privacy. But uh, uh, what is it? This uh, certification for European specialist nurse. This certification is based on some uh, underpinnings and, uh, you know, these underpinnings are represented by nursing education, nursing li licensure, registration, if applicable, because we have seen that in different countries, you know, there is uh, an heterogeneity of this uh, registration, nursing experience, professional reference, and uh, on the professional nursing specialty organization. In our case, uh, the, the EU, uh, specialty nurses organizations. And the purpose, the main purpose of this certification uh, of, uh, is uh, to credential, to recognize those nurses who have acquired the education, training, skills, professional experience and practice as specialist nurses uh, at the European level. And this certificate will be awarded to those who apply, who voluntarily apply and successfully meet the qualification framework criteria. You know, this uh, could be the first step to have uh, a professional recognition uh, and, and also to facilitate, you know, the mobility and the recognition of these competencies uh, in, in a wider Europe. And, uh, you know, this, uh, this recognition could provide the employer and the public with evidence that specialty nurses have attained a standardized higher level of competence. And, uh, you know, this, uh, this certification can provide nurses and specialist nurses uh, in particular, because it's aimed for them uh, with the impetus for continual education and professional development. So is, uh, is uh, this certification for the European specialist nurse is an evidence-based portfolio assessment of education, credential, specialized nursing experience and skills. This assessment uh, represents ESNO and CGFNS official recognition of the individual's ev evidence supporting their recognition, I mean the recognition of specialist nurses as clinical experts and professional nurse in a specific specialty area. This certification will be transferable across the nurse's career span and serve as the foundation for future career advancement and possibly as an improvement of cross-border healthcare and professional mobility for nurses with postgraduate training qualification. So these are the aims of, of our project and who might be certified a nurse that has met all the eligibility requirements as identified in the certified European Specialist Nurse Framework and has submitted the evidence of achieving the requirements. So candidates uh, must provide evidence of successful completion of a basic education in nursing and a recognized program in a related specialty, such as the different specialties that are embedded in the European Specialist Nurses Organization. But if you would like to have a, a, a depth look of uh, the eligibility, eligibility requirements, you know, it's, uh, these are some, some of our ideas to have these requirements for these specialist nurses if they would like to be voluntarily recognized as specialist nurses. At least two years of nursing practice in the area of specialization with a minimum of 1,500 practice hour in a specialty area. And uh, the candidates must, must have an active and unrestricted nursing license 
or registration if applicable in the country of education or practice. Candidates must submit two professional references that certify the various competencies in the area of specialization. And candidates may, must be active members of professional organizations in the area of specialization. And uh, we have uh, also uh, thought of, of a certificate for uh, the uh, certified European specialist nurses. And, uh, and uh, we really hope uh, that uh, this program can flourish in the next months and in the next years. And uh, I would like to, to highlight that this program is, is, is very well embedded in the, in the development plan and campaign of ESNO for, the, for this decade till 2030. And we really hope that this program can be instrumental to have a wider recognition, a more stable recognition, also official recognition at wider level and I mean at the European level among different countries. And I, I would be more than happy to answer to your questions about this program. And I would like to acknowledge all of you for listening. Thank you so much. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you so much, uh, Alessandro uh, and uh, Luigi for presenting um, uh, two very important uh, activities uh, under the ESNOS umbrella. Uh, I invite people, if they have uh, questions, uh, to post them via the chat or the Q&A uh, area, uh, since uh, we need to move on to the next uh, part of our uh, program, um, which is the debates and discussion uh, part. So I'm going to hand over to Thompson, uh, and Thompson, uh, I think, is going to introduce the panel to us. I am indeed. Thank you very much, Bert, and uh, to our two previous presenters. So here we have a wonderful panel who are going to share some of their perspectives and comments on this campaign and the program for the decade of the European Specialist Nurse. So I'm delighted we have Kaiser Imanin from the European Patients Forum. She's the Director of Policy there. We have Nico de Kock, who is the Pedagogic Director and Senior Healthcare Manager um, and a nurse from the Anesthesia, anesthesia sector and Danielle Lewelt, who is the academic lead in nursing, but particularly working at the uh, ICN, I think, if I, if I got the information correct. So you, you can give us perhaps some perspectives. We just announced this big campaign. You've heard where it came from. It started in 2020 with great pride, the year of the nurse. Then the pandemic happened and there was a lot of clapping and nurses were put under incredible pressure. And there's a recognition that particularly within nursing, the role of the specialist nurse is not well understood. It's not uh, equivalent in different countries. It's not appropriately recognized. And at this critical time where we heard from Maya that 15 out of the 29 countries who, in, in their national reports identified a lack of healthcare workers as a key challenge. This is the moment to make the case about what is a specialist nurse, what do they contribute, what could they do in terms of leadership uh, and partnerships. So let's hear from you, your comments on, on this campaign and how you see this campaign might help you achieve your own objectives, how it would have an impact in the work that you're doing. Kasia, can I start with you from the patient's perspective? Yes, of course. Thank you so much, um, Tamsin, for the introduction and thank you, Bear and ESNO team for inviting me um, to contribute today. Um, since I'm um, here speaking on behalf of the European Patients Forum, which is an umbrella patient organization comprising um, almost 80 member organizations across Europe, many of them disease, disease advocacy organizations, we know our community knows very well the, the value of specialist nurses. Um, I think because I probably don't have very much time, I'm not going to dwell on the pandemic experience. Obviously, it was very, very hard and nurses have been um, playing a key role. And in many cases, like Bear said, doing things they really shouldn't have to do. And I think now when we um, are emerging slowly, I hope, from the pandemic, we think that some serious attention will need to be paid um, now to improving the healthcare systems and really thinking beyond the pandemic, because uh, we have seen so many issues brought to the fore during the pandemic that in terms of inequalities, lack of access, uh, the effect of delaying care to patients that actually 
and the lack of patient-centeredness and patient involvement that uh, we already knew already before the pandemic. It's just that the pandemic happened and brought these issues into the forefront somehow. And um, obviously we need to look at more fundamental changes in the healthcare systems in order to truly become, uh, that they truly become patient-centered person and people-centered as well. And clearly a health workforce that is well-trained, resourced, and with people who have the right skills, the knowledge and the attitudes to deliver this kind of care is extremely important. And I think we also need to consider um, maybe reconsider the traditional roles and tasks. There was a presentation earlier on task shifting so that the knowledge and skills of all the professionals can be used in the most meaningful and effective way to deliver care that delivers the, what patients need. Uh, and of course, nurses are often seen by patients as the one professional group that is very close to them. Um, the people who see up close what they experience and patients do tend to see nurses as important providers of information, important um, professionals with whom they can spend more time perhaps than with medical doctors and really ask questions and get support on the daily care. Um, so as we are now talking also about shifting care closer to the patient, being less disease centered, uh, more personal, more holistic and more community based, I think the specialist nurse's role will inevitably increase in importance. And of course, all the professionals will have to work more across professional borders. Uh, I don't have to repeat the importance of the specialist nurse in different um, contexts like disease management programs, rehabilitation, palliative care, self-management support, and contributing to the accessibility of healthcare services. Uh, we have taken good note of what has been said today, but also already before, there has been quite a bit of research that found that um, certain tasks trained nurses could take over from doctors with uh, the overall quality of care being equally high and patient outcomes being equally good. And indeed, in some cases, not surprisingly, patients were more satisfied with nurse-led care. And this includes also prescribing, where um, some studies have found that patients adhere better and again have better satisfaction with similar outcomes overall. So from our perspective, given that there is a, a growing demand, especially for gro um, chronic care and complex care, if things can be done more efficiently, whilst always keeping the safety and quality of patient, uh, quality of care and patient safety rather, at the heart of it, this would be very welcome. Uh, and I think here, when we discuss about health workforce policies, there should always be a patient perspective in these discussions. Uh, it was fun, funny to hear that someone mentioned that nurses are often on the menu, but not at the table when it comes to policy making. And we found that this is uh, very often true for patients too, particularly in, when it comes to health work for, workforce policy. This is an area where patients views have not really been invited at European level. There are other contexts, of course, where collaborations are ongoing, but I think in EU um, health policy, we need to drive a change in future. And I can see several areas of collaboration where we can work with specialist nurses on this kind of policy advocacy. Uh, for example, cons um, considering patient um, involvement in the continuing professional education and training of nurses, something we are currently in EPF looking at with uh, specialist doctors, and it would be a very natural continuum to also talk to nurses and see how we can um, um, collaborate and, and gain learnings also from existing projects that we know have been done by patient and nurse organizations in different disease areas. And another very important one, in my opinion, would be to explore the digital transformation, because this is affecting all the aspects of care and the patient's journey, but also how patients interact with different professionals, the roles and, and how we relate to each other as human beings. So it might be very interesting to explore the patient-nurse relationship in this light, given that both of our groups are among the end users of digital solutions who are often not involved early enough in co-designing the tools. And of course, from my personal perspective, and I'll stop here, would be um, I would love to work together on patient safety advocacy because this, this is such an important area and um, at European level, it's a bit neglected at the moment. But there are initi initiatives ongoing um, also with the WHO European region 
So um, patients have a lot to contribute, families have a lot to contribute, and nurses also, so we could work together in that, I'm sure. Thank you. Thank you very much. And so it, it's very clear there's there's areas of shared advocacy. You know, both patients and nurses' voices tend to be, you know, underweight in policy discussions at, at uh, European and national level. And there's an opportunity to share, it's particularly because of the close relationship, as you've said, the partnership between nurses and patients. Nico, let me bring you in now. Um, and I wonder if you want to comment on um, what Maya said at the beginning, because Maya said, you know, good news, I've got good news. I've announced a funding call and there'll be a funding call for a call for proposals on continuous professional education. And it was a part of me that was thinking, oh, that sounds great. It's really exciting. And then I remember that when I asked Bear, which of the five pillars was the most important for the campaign? He said, getting proper recognition in all European countries, that there is such a thing as specialist nurses. So, yes, it's great. There's a, there's a, fun, a potential funding call. But until we've got this statutory change and a recognition of the specialist nurses, that's that to me sounds like there's a, there's a contradictory message there. On the one hand, yes, they want to fund some activities around training, but unless that training leads into a recognized advanced or specialist nurses position, then we've got a gap. What's your perspective? Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Thank you to all the speakers for their high quality presentations, first of all. Um, I think uh, I noted uh, I had also a double feeling about that. I, it, it was the, really the, these words that I put it on, on my paper. Because if you see, um, uh, we have some congresses uh, in, the, in the past few years. We had COVID as a catalyzer of uh, specialist nurse positioning about uh, awareness, about the complexity of care. And that's two elements, if you see them, you always, always the same elements are coming back and we don't go further about policy, about strategy. How can we, what uh, the, the, the presentation of uh, task shifting, I see the same thing in, uh, in France, the presentation about uh, uh, certification, I see it also on a national level. I think we have really to go further because at the moment we have an increased awareness of this complexity needed, uh, recognized in, in caring for, for spe uh, by specialist nurses. But at the moment, we can get uh, at a break point. If we don't go further in the recognition by policymakers on a uh, higher mi mi micro, mi micro environment, we, we, we can uh, have a, a reverse adverse uh, stra strategy. And so we can lose all attractivity about how can we uh, put this uh, complexity uh, in an educational program that leads to something uh, that gives uh, a specialist nurse or an advanced nurse this recognition to say, I'm uh, in this whole healthcare system, I have found a place on a regulatory base. And that's really important, I think. And we need really to go further. And this year, we talk about a decade. It's for me, we have to really to uh, uh, boost this uh, whole process of recognition on a European level and uh, um, take all energy and synergy and partnership. The EU uh, uh, are talking about partnership. Uh, it's really uh, important to use also the, these guidelines uh, that uh, Corinne uh, uh, cited about uh, I, uh, ISN. It's all, it's something new, it's very recent. We have this uh, publication at, with ESNO that also will be something that underlines uh, this whole uh, system that uh, are barriers for recognition. And so we have to use it and really uh, stick together to uh, 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 upgrade it into a strategy for uh, in Europe. Thank you, Nico. And as you say, I mean, the, the, the education has to fit into a broader context. Mm -hmm. So if we're, we're developing educational pathways that lead to new qualifications, those qualifications 
also then need to be applied. So mm. there needs to be space within healthcare systems for yeah. new levels of practice, mm. but also in decision making, in planning of healthcare systems, in yeah. allocation of resources, in developing new guidelines. So I think you're making the point that yes, education paths are great, but what do those paths then lead to? Yeah. And I think that's that's an extremely interesting question. I'm about to pass to Daniela, and then I'm going to invite questions from the floor. We had a question earlier that I'm not sure that we qualified to answer, which which is about do you think European countries also need to improve the e-hospital system for nursing as other non-developed countries? So I've just I've recognized that we've had that question, but I'm not sure how we fit that into the conversation that we're having now. So but I do invite you to put your questions about the campaign, about the decade, about what you might want to achieve, put it in the Q&A and I'll invite the panel to speak on it in a minute. Daniela, let me bring you in now and you've got a perspective that's more global. You've heard a little bit about what we have planning to do in Europe. Also, at the same time, at global level, there's been a lot of excitement about healthcare workers. Um, we've had the year of the nurse and the midwife. This That triggered here in Europe an understanding that we need to do more to explain what are specialist nurses, what's their contribution, what's their possibility, and then how health systems address this. Can you give us a sense of how this fits into what you're seeing at global level? Sure, yeah, thank you very much uh, for the introduction there and thanks uh, the ethno team and uh, bear for the invitation. Is it okay if I share my slides there for one yes, second? Go I ahead. just have a few slides, I won't keep you long. Uh, let me just see if I can manage this. Yes, yeah, should be here. So yes, my name is Daniela Lewald and I'm the chair of the International Council of Nurses, Nurse Practitioner, Advanced Practice Nurse Network. In my voluntary capacity, and I suppose the confusion at the beginning, um, we all have a day job. And I guess my day job is an academic leader in nursing in Dublin City University in Ireland. I'm native German and I'm residing in Ireland. So Europe is obviously a close uh, of my heart all the time, although we're working globally with ICN. Just wanted to give a brief snapshot of the European trends and challenges with regards to advanced practice nursing uh, for today. No. Yes, so we heard a little bit about this. The ICN uh, guidelines um, give kind of a trying to prov provide some common understanding with regards to advanced practice nursing. And in the guidelines, the advanced practice nursing is described as an umbrella term that focuses on the two main roles in relation to advanced practice nursing. There are many more, but just focusing on the two, there are clinical nurse specialists who are experts, clinical advisors, and consultants who are based, uh, they're basing their care on established diagnosis on patients who are already diagnosed in a specialized field of practice. And they're also engaged in patient education and systems education uh, across staff within various healthcare systems. And nurse practitioners who, is, who are different advanced practice nurses, I suppose, who are really kind of creating this bridge between nursing and medicine. They uh, integrate clinical skills associated with nursing and medicine in order to assess, diagnose and manage patients in various healthcare settings, often without the need uh, for a physician to be present there. So I just wanted to uh, highlight that as a definition, but it has come up already. The guidelines, if you haven't read them already, were certainly recommended. They're available in English, uh, French, and Spanish, and the the, um, the link is down there at the bottom. Yes, yeah, so and internationally, I suppose you can see down the left the map. Within the network, we have re representation from all these countries that are highlighted there in red. And as you may know, advanced practice nursing developed um, within the English speaking countries first, come from the United States of America, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, UK and Ireland. And within Europe, uh, the English speaking countries um, and generally I suppose globally uh, are the ones who have the advanced practice nursing role mostly uh, established uh, probably uh, very well. Or, uh, and I suppose within Europe, also the Netherlands. Um, however, there's a global spread but depending on where you find yourself uh, within the world, you will find that advanced practice nursing is developed uh, to uh, at different stages of development. So um, you might find yourself somewhere in an English speaking country where advanced practice nursing is very well established. And then you might find yourself in another country where advanced practice nursing is developing or it may be thought about to develop. 
So within Europe, we do have a lack of nurses, as we know from within the network, from our members and from our research that we're carrying out, that there's a lack of nurses that are fully practicing at nurse practitioner, advanced practice nursing level with an expanded clinical decision-making authority in direct patient care. So these people are not managers, they're not educators. These are clinical practitioners working at a level beyond the, clin the, the, uh, the general nurse and the specialist nurse, at clinical nurse specialist or nurse practitioner level. And they need the authority to provide care without the presence of a physician and uh, be able to prescribe, order and evaluate tests, diagnostic tests, physically assess, diagnose and treat patients, admit and discharge. And to exactly what uh, Kaiser was just saying there, uh, to provide timely care for patients. That's the main point. It's about patient care, reducing patient waiting lists, running smooth services and effective uh, services and provide patient-centered care, which results in higher le levels of patient satisfaction. Um, and if you think, you know, what's this woman talking about? <laughs> These roles do exist. So if you wanted to, to look it up, I guess, in terms of getting some examples, within Ireland, we have these profiles of advanced nurse and midwife practitioners and clinical nurse and midwife specialists, and they give, a good, give good, good case examples of what these nurses actually do and where, you know, what, what area specialist areas they're in. So in terms of a wish list, what we would like to see over the next decade, and um, we would love to see more um, clinical nurse specialists and nurse practitioners and other advanced nursing roles within Europe being uh, uh, developed, and they need to be designated and protected roles and, and those roles that nurses can fully function in and at a full capacity. Um, and that requires regulation. So we do, and we have heard that before today, so I'm not, not saying anything new there. Uh, we need to le legalize nurses' authority to prescribe medications, diagnose and treat patients. We do need title protection for the nurses in advanced nursing roles. And with that comes pay scales. I do make the point that they also need to be paid at an advanced level. And that's very important and that needs to be done. And we certainly have achieved that within Ireland. Uh, and education is, I think, the key to all of that, I suppose. It's, it's that kind of what Bear was talking about, that campaign is so important for this because we, where, whereas, like, I, I work as a nurse practitioner, I know what the role is, and I'm involved in this for over 20 years, but um, a lot of the times within our healthcare um, colleagues, it's advanced nursing what, you know, so it, it, the, the understanding isn't quite there. So we actually need, need to educate ourselves, our colleagues, the public, very important, policy makers, the hospital managers and the health insurance systems as well. So there's a lot of things that we need to do. We need to be much, much louder. This has been a quiet revolution so far. And I think we need to get loud about that. So that's what I would wish for. And there are massive programs all across Europe, as far as I'm aware, um, for advanced practice nursing. But I do think we could review them and maybe shape them up a little bit, in particular with regards to the clinical placements and with regards to clinical competency parts within the programs. Uh, so just to mention, if anybody's interested, we have a conference going on in Dublin, in Ireland. If you'd like to come over, hopefully COVID will permit us to have this in person, 21st to 24th of August, 2022. Um, the links are down there below. And there's also the membership list and here are the references. So thanks very much. Just wanted to. Thank you. That. Thank you for that, uh, uh, Danielle. And of course, your slides will be shared with everyone as part of the material. So they'll be able to see that and uh, the information about your conference. Let me pick up a couple of questions that we've received from the audience. And we've had a question that I think is probably going to end up um, going to Nico. We've had a question from Siv Staffseth, who says the master's degree is decided uh, by the Bologna process for specialist nurses. Is this still the policy of ESNO? that you want to have the master's degree for specialist nurses should be part of the Bologna process. Nico, is that something you can answer? Yes, uh, thank you. Um, so the master's degree, uh, I think, uh, will be uh, at a level of advanced nurses and the specialist nurse is between uh, a general nurse, uh, the level between. So. Um, I think uh, so, uh, as um, uh, was shown in the slide with uh, certification, the master's degree uh, uh, is needed if we uh, will uh, uh, have recognition for uh, the, an advanced level. That will be uh, the, the condition to get into uh, uh, an advanced level recognition for nurses. And beyond, we will have uh, a, a whole uh, space for specialist nurses 
uh, that can also have uh, this uh, professional educational evolution. Thank you. And I, I noticed just on this point, we've had a comment in the chat from Christine, who's saying that perhaps we need to make a difference between specialist nurse and uh, the, the clinical nurse specialist and APN, yes. because, you know, one might needs to have a master's level, but uh, for a specialist nurse, a post bachelor degree mm. is enough. And that's a message from Christine. And I see Daniela's nodding. Karina, I know you wanted to uh, come in and you've got a question for Daniela. So let me pass the microphone okay. to you. Thank you very much, Daniela. And I believe you were part of the team on ICM. It was, to I'm develop. writing this, yes. So I'm going to ask the right question. I hope I asked I the right I person the question. <laughs> so, I mean, when I was looking through the document, what was interesting was that um, unlike previous sort of documents and research, uh, the emphasis on the shortage of doctors was not evident. And I have uh, like a direct query about this, you know, because I believe wrongly or rightly, it's my hypothesis that um, the development, especially of uh, NPs and nurse practitioners is directly related to the lack of doctors in the place. Okay. And yeah. sorry. Sorry. And in Malta, let us say, we don't have that. We don't have the evidence that uh, we have a shortage of doctors. So even talking about prescription in such countries like Malta will put their backs up. Um, unlike, you know, areas like specialist nurses and their development in skills and all that, that I think will happen and will continue. What's your thoughts about this issue of the development? Yeah, thank you very much, Corinne. This is a brilliant, uh, but they, they are brilliant questions. And I, I think you're right, like traditionally, uh, when the role, particularly of the nurse practitioner started to develop, it was really based, and it was the same in Ireland, based on uh, the kind of shortage of doctors, quite often in specific areas, maybe in the community or in rural areas, you know, so, and that's where nurses kind of stepped in and said, well, look, you know, maybe we can we can kind of bridge that gap and uh, they they did that and that's how it kind of all started at this point i suppose in terms of prescribing what i would say is it's not as if and i think when we talk about task shifting it has to be just understood that we're we're, we're not talking about you know maybe nurse pres uh, prescribing to become something that just the nurses do then you know there's actually enough work for all of us <laughs> you know from, from from my experience I would say it never ends actually it gets better and that's the good thing you know so actually if nurses and doctors can prescribe and in, in Ireland actually some pharmacists can prescribe and in the UK there's others who can prescribe too so it's just to improve the patient experience if the patient needs a painkiller needs it now if the nurse is there and she has prescribing rights, she can do that. She doesn't have to wait for the surgeon coming back from theater at six o'clock in the evening. It can be done then. And that's the timely element of it. So that's, I suppose, more what we talk about nowadays. But I think, yes, you're right. And um, there are and still, you know, if we have shortages of, of uh, doctors in certain areas, quite often we see nurses slotting in there and actually, you know, bridging that gap. So that's how it develops quite often. Yeah. Thank you very much. And um, we, we've got just three minutes left in this session. And what I'd like to do is I'll ask each of our panelists that um, just, you know, in, in one minute, we've, we're seeing with, with this campaign, ESNO is being very bold and it's stepping out of just looking at issues related to nursing, but actually picking up on the broader issue of health system reform, looking at leadership decisions about the way things are done and also encouraging nurses and specialist nurses to be more open in their storytelling to sort of really come front and center if there's one message that you'd like to share with the nurses uh, specialist nurses who are making this bold step a word of encouragement what you'd like to say to the two we, we want to build the momentum this is the beginning of a 10-year process what would you like to share as your message I can start. <laughs> Go ahead, Daniela. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I would say to anybody practicing out there, I know that you have lots of experience. You're out there in your area and you know it 100%. I know that I'm an ICU nurse by background myself, so I know you know your stuff. So what you need to do in terms of leadership is think about, you know, what could be done better? And you know what can be done better. But take that and try to push the boundaries try to get that done and you can lead that. You're the nurse, you can lead it. You need support, but you can do that. And I think that's what we need to do. Thank you. Nico. 
I would like to underline the value of a human being to be uh, a professional and to be there for caring professionals, uh, patients, and that we have our own professional creativity to uh, confront and to to uh, to, to take care uh, of uh, patients, uh, even uh, we are in a difficult and complex situation. Thank you. Kasia, go ahead. Last message to the patients. Well, I think it's a great campaign and stories can be really powerful. So um, go ahead and tell your stories. And I think you have an ally in our community because our community knows the value of a specialist nurse is probably much better than the average person will know. So also get in touch maybe with our organizations and see if we can help spread the message. That's excellent. And I want to say a warm thank you to our panelists for sharing this. And I'm now going to hand over to um, Bert, who's going to give us the last section. Thank you so much um, uh, to all the panelists, uh, as well as uh, Thompson for uh, uh, making sure this, um, this, uh, this discussion was uh, obviously was in good hands. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so um, it's already uh, the last part of, of today's conference. Um, and um, um, it's time for, uh, I suppose, drawing some conclusions uh, before uh, I will hand over uh, to your president. Um, so um, having had the honor and the, and the pleasure to participate uh, as a moderator in the three most recent ASNOS uh, conferences starting in 2019, uh, I'm very pleased uh, to have heard so many of your uh, personal uh, as well as professional uh, views uh, and obviously I've also read uh, many of these in the, in the chat box uh, today and I think it's it's because of the open character of ESNO um, and, and ESNO uh, conferences that I feel confident to share some uh, today some concluding remarks and some personal reflections on today's conference uh, and the two previous ones so um, let me start, uh, which is which al almost seems like a mission impossible, uh, to give you three takeaways uh, from today's conference. Um, there are so many, uh, I think, important uh, messages being provided, but uh, I will give it a go. Obviously, I think my first takeaway is the ESNO campaign. Uh, I, I'm, I can't remember that I've seen such a um, uh, massive, um, well thought uh, campaign um, running over uh, an e extensive uh, period of time. So with a lot of opportunities, I suppose, uh, to uh, also to make changes and make improvements um, on the go. Uh, and I think that is, uh, that is very important. I like the idea of um, uh, the Olympic rings, uh, perhaps instead of the five pillars. Uh, which uh, makes it perhaps even more challenging. I think uh, the, the campaign will indeed, I think be very important to increase visibility, uh, to um, make sure uh, that uh, specialist nurses uh, contribute with their specific expertise uh, in terms of improving um, the health of people and obviously to promote recognition. Um, so um, congrats to ESNO uh, for um, uh, launching such a, a campaign. And I'm, look forward, I'm looking forward, uh, I already looked forward to the 12th May every year, but now I have an uh, even more important uh, reason to do so. Um, second, uh, and I think that is the, uh, at least to, to me, that's the sticky phrase of today uh, from Corinne and Kaisa uh, used the, the, the phrase as well, on the menu, not on the table. Um, and um, I suppose both nurses and patients feel this way. Um, so it's time to join forces. Um, and I think um, from today, we've seen that there are uh, a few opportunities um, which have been more visible over the last years. One is uh, the shortage in terms of the workforce. Uh, second is the, um, the uh, uh, digital healthcare, uh, the uh, introduction of all kinds of tools. 
Uh, and third, uh, I suppose the, uh, the biggest one is the transformation of healthcare systems. So um, perhaps to make the sticky phrase uh, even more sticky uh, or more attractive, uh, why not, um, why can't we move from on the menu uh, towards the table, but perhaps even why not become the chef? Um, and I think that that um, resonates with um, Corinne's message in terms of leadership. My third takeaway, and I think that is what uh, Maya Matthews um, gave to us, um, her, her three takeaways were based, I think, on evidence. Um, the, the three takeaways she provided to us have a strong uh, evidence base. And so I'm glad to see that the fifth pillar of ESNO's campaign is about research, research on specialist nursing in Europe. So, um, and I think um, research is really important uh, pillar uh, as a kind of a conditional pillar for the other four pillars. So I'm, I'm really hoping um, that you can make use of the opportunities being provided by the a European Commission in terms of subsidies for research, <clears throat> but perhaps also from the uh, other uh, opportunities being provided by uh, sponsors or perhaps uh, by gaining national uh, funding for uh, research uh, and uh, make use of that uh, in order to uh, realize your uh, campaign goals. Um, so since the past three years, uh, much has changed uh, simultaneously uh, on but also simultaneously on some crucial aspects, nothing has changed. What has changed, I think, uh, from my perspective, is I've seen ESNO grown immensely, uh, sharing a clear vision uh, and um, a very uh, appealing strategy, which we have seen uh, all today. And already uh, being able to achieve some of the first uh, very promising uh, results in this respect. Um, a European health bubble without ESNO, I think, is unthinkable. Um, ESNO, you are leaving your mark in all kinds of networks and you're providing insights and showing your expertise. And even more importantly, you are also um, uh, learning and collaborating with others. In the aim of recognition and harmonization of education of the specialist nurse, I, I believe you are on the right track. But an important question to address here is uh, whether the existing European um, health workforce uh, outline or structure is ready for this. Um, I think we haven't seen such readiness yet. Uh, I strongly believe that is not because of unwillingness, but because existing health systems uh, with their normative contexts, they tend to be rather conservative and hence slowly moving into new directions. So it's comforting to see that ESNO is moving and as such, it would be interesting to see who will be following. And um, please take this as an open invitation. I also strongly think that the campaign, uh, the decade of the specialist nurse is a great vehicle to take this momentum and to further grow in your role and position. The recognition of the specialist nurse is well established in some countries. However, it is far uh, too limited from a European or cross-national uh, perspective. So there is significant unwanted fragmentation in this respect. And here is a major challenge for ESNO and its member associations, uh, as this situation requires your collective action. Finally, uh, Burr, before I hand over to uh, your president, Burr kindly reminded me to notify you that in the days or the weeks to come, uh, ESNO will be contacting you with a feedback form uh, with a certificate or attendance, certificate of attendance for those who wish such a certificate and some after sales. So you will um, also uh, re receive frequent updates on the progress and you may wish to become part of this moving campaign. And I've already seen people volunteering to become part of this volunteering in a chat box today. Uh, and <clears throat> finally, uh, obviously, uh, like myself, you can always join ESNO as an associate. So um, on that note, thank you so much. And let me please over for the um, real closing of today's uh, conference. Uh, let me please over to uh, Dr. Adriano Friganovic, uh, your president. Well, Adriano. 
Thank you, Bert. Dear colleagues, it was a real pleasure to listen to such a great speakers today and make one more step in a building a world of specialist nurses in Europe. Our ESNO vision is very clear. It set a specialist nursing as a paradigm of the future of healthcare and a sure recognition within the European Union and wider. At the end of the Congress, I want to thank to all participants for supporting ESNO activities and invite you to participate even more. We have a lot of plans, projects, and ideas for everyone. I would say the sky is the limit. Special thanks go to the ZN, Lizian and Gabia, and our host, Tamsin Rose and Bert Bierhoff are really the best and great support to ESNO. Speakers such as Maya, Corinne, Kaisa, Daniela, Bear, Luigi, Alessandro, Nico give, give special value to, to this event and I congratulate to everyone. And at the end, I want to invite you to our next Congress 2023, which will be held in the Brussels, first and second of June. Success of every ESNO event depends on you and we are looking forward to see you again. I wish you nice afternoon and see you again in the Brussels. Thank you, I will come. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Bye. Have a nice day. Okay. Have a nice day. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Oh,